Thank you, Sabinia. Planetary defence and mitigation solutions. What do we do about it? So, so Mark, what are the options on the table? Well, um, so I, I'd like to start by quoting my colleague Don Yeomans, who's the former head of the um, Near Earth Object Program Office at Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he said there are really three rules for planetary defense: find them early, find them early, and find them early. <laughs> and and I, I really agree with that. I, the, the most important thing is surveys and to find them far enough ahead of time to actually do something about it. Because if you wait too long, if, if, uh, if the impacting object that you discover is impacting in the near future, there's not a lot you can do about it. If you find it decades in advance, you can actually push it very slowly and move it from the trajectory that it's on. So we like to talk, we scientists like to talk in terms of probabilities. Um, that probability is an expression of our lack of knowledge, of our own ignorance. The asteroids are on, they're, they're at a given time, they are at some point in space with some speed and that is precise. We just don't know that with precision. So they all know where they're going and they're either gonna hit the Earth or they're not. We need to find the ones that are going to hit the Earth and we need to find them way in advance. So they're gonna follow a trajectory and it's almost like they're on rails. Uh, they, they are on a well-defined trajectory and we need to change that. And one way to change that is to give them a little push. Um, the simplest way is to give them a very slow push just with a rocket motor, even a very weak thrust rocket motor, just gently push them so they deviate from that set of railroad tracks that they were originally on. And by the time they get around many orbits, they've separated by the radius or the diameter of the Earth and they miss the Earth. Mm. But if we wait too long, we need something more forceful and there are impulsive methods hitting it with an impact um, and we can hit it with a, with, with a mass and transfer momentum to the asteroid just by Newton's laws. Um, we create ejecta, that makes its own little rocket engine. That's impulsive, so you bump it off and then it follows a new set of rails and hopefully that set of rails does not um, intersect with the Earth. And if you wait too long, you need something even bigger than that. And then the, the last fallback um, idea is using a nuclear explosion. That's why we want to find them early. But that, that, that just blows it into little bits, potentially, well, doesn't no. it? So uh, uh, can you deflect yeah, it? Yeah, there, there are ways to, uh, especially for a very large asteroid, um, you can set off a nuclear explosion right next to the asteroid, make, make a crater. Um, so you make a crater in the asteroid, and it does kind of the same thing that the kinetic impactor would do. Or there's another idea where you actually set off the explosion at some distance, and just the the particles from the nuclear explosion interact with the surface, heat the surface, and that creates vapor. And the acceleration of the vapor pushes the entire asteroid. Naomi, th this goes back to something we've discussed over and over again, really, which is that the, the nature of the asteroid itself needs to be understood uh, before we decide exactly what to do with it. So could you just talk a little bit about the, the history of the detailed characterization of them? Yeah, of course. So I think one thing that we need to remember is that every single asteroid mission that we do, we learn so much. And so every mission is a bonus. And so if we can go back to the first asteroid missions, although there were some flyby missions in the early 90s, it was really the rendezvous missions, so the missions that get up, got up close and personal with the asteroids Eros and Itakawa that really changed our perspective on these bodies. So before going to them for the first time, there were a lot of people that thought that asteroids were just boring, inactive lumps of bare rock in space. Um, but in fact, when we got there, um, we got to Eros for the first time, we saw this body was anything but bare and boring. It was covered with, uh, with regolith, with this granular material. There were ponds of dust that had accumulated on the surface uh, of this body. And there's even evidence that there are uh, seismic activity, there's asteroid quakes going on inside this body. Uh, 
And then after that, there was the Japanese mission, of course, to asteroid Itikawa. And then we turned up and again, we saw something completely different. We saw what we call a rubble pile asteroid. So that means that it's not just one monolithic block. It's several little blocks and grains and sand all held together just under the self-gravity of the body. So this type of information is so important when we want to try to prepare future missions and future deflection missions. And so it's very difficult to understand what happens at the surface of these bodies. And so there's a lot of work going on trying to understand, for example, how we would land on the surface of an asteroid. And at Iso Supero, we've been building a low gravity machine using a drop tower and counterweights to try to understand how we can get down and touch and interact with the surface of these bodies to learn more for future missions. Because it is, it's it's easier said than done landing on an asteroid. We wanted to yeah. attach a rocket motor, for example, because there isn't a great deal of gravity there, is there? It's incredibly difficult. So the gravity on some of these small asteroids is a million times less than what we have here on Earth. And so if you want to try to understand what this gravity is like, you really need to do some very advanced experiments like this uh, cooperation that we have between several departments at my institute to build this drop tower mm. or parabolic flight experiments, for example. Now, Ed, um, speaking of gravity, one of the um, beautiful uh, suggestions for deflecting an asteroid is the gravity tug. Is it, could you describe that idea? Yeah, that's a simple way of deflecting an asteroid. Well, you don't actually need to know what. It's one of the few methods that doesn't actually require that you know what that asteroid's sure. made of, uh, because you don't actually touch it. What you do is you hover a small spacecraft somewhere close to it, but not, not that close to it. And what you do is you, you angle your rocket engines out, which keep you from actually dropping down onto the asteroid, away from the asteroid. So if you think of a, a spacecraft like this with four rocket engines like that, think of a rotating asteroid here, which is spinning and going about its merry way. There'll be a tiny force of, of attraction between your spacecraft and the asteroid. Uh, but, but that can act like a tow line as you, as you, you basically stay in position. Um, it's a, it'd be a fraction of a newton, which is, you know, you can think of something like, uh, you know, a couple pieces of paper or something like that. But that force added up over a period of weeks, months, or even years can actually significantly change the trajectory of an asteroid. So it's a paradox so in, in spacecraft design, isn't it? Because you want your spacecraft to be as massive as possible in that yeah, case. In case you want to be as wasteful as possible. In some sense, you want to have the heaviest possible uh, spacecraft. What you could actually do to make your spacecraft more effective is to grab a rock off the surface, lift it up, and use it as extra weight, if you'd like, to, uh, uh, to tug harder on the, on the asteroid itself. Now, uh, Patrick, could you tell us about the missions that are currently ongoing with regards yeah, to asteroids. Are, there are a few missions ongoing and which uh, actually demonstrate that it is not as simple as Ed was saying, even though uh, I, I like the idea, but it's not as simple because we have for the moment two missions which are on their way to two different asteroids to get a sample. So uh, Osiris Rex from NASA launched in uh, 2016 in September and Hayabusa 2 from JAXA launched in 2014. The two of them will arrive next year on their respective asteroids. So we'll have absolutely amazing things to say next year because we'll have the first images of two different near-Earth asteroids, by the way, which are from the spectral observation rich in organic material and carbonaceous material. So this is really in order to understand the uh, origin of the solar system. Uh, the target of Rosaris Rex is uh, well characterized. It's called Bennu. It's about uh, 500 meters in size. It has a shape which is, uh, as we say, an oblate spheroid. Think of a popcorn and very uh, under dense, by the way. So like a popcorn, very light. Uh, and then the, the target of uh, uh, Hayabusa 2 is a Ryugu, is a 800 meter in size, so bigger. So we'll be able to see how things scale with a different gravity. And by the way, in Hayabusa 2, there is a, a, a lander made by DLR and uh, the French space agency CNES, which will uh, uh, in principle land on the surface and make in situ measurements. There will be also a small impactor that will make a crater. And uh, just to, 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 to show that it's not as simple, like if we say, okay, we're gonna take a rock to take it and use it as a gravity tractor. When we see how difficult it is to take a sample, the Osiris Rex target 60 grams of sample up to two kilograms, Ayabusa 2 a milligram. And the reason is that, I mean, it's very difficult to interact with the surface. We just take five seconds because there is no gravity. So if you want to take a boulder 
you probably need to anchor first or you, you need to know something about the border because if you don't know the constitution, maybe it will disaggregate when you take it. So we don't know much about these things. It's a very sensitive environment. And that's why, you know, even on paper, it seems easy. But in practice, you need to learn. So I don't, think, I don't say it's unfeasible, but it's more complicated than just doing it on paper. There are two other missions that have been selected by, uh, by NASA, which is uh, Lucy, will go to see the Trojan, asteroid Trojans, which are the asteroids that um, share the same orbit as Jupiter. So very, uh, very primitive ones. And then another fascinating one called Psyche, which will visit the asteroid Psyche, which is a metallic asteroid, maybe the core of a protoplanet. So will be really able to understand you know the process of differentiation of planets how heavy elements go in the in the center and light one light one around i think this is fascinating then as you see i talked about nasa i talked about japanese mission unfortunately for the moment i don't have anything to say and jan will talk about it about a european mission because unless the mission that was planned to assist the deflection experiment is funded, we don't have any mission on asteroid in Europe for the next 15 years at minimum. So fortunately, we have the other agencies doing something. But for the European, it's a disaster because all the expertise gained with Rosetta will be lost if nothing happened. Ian, it must be. It's a difficult job because I, I suppose you hear this. You're a program manager at ESA. Yeah. So you hear this from every sphere, yes. every yes. different la layer or leg of astronomy. How do you go about selecting these missions? Well, um, in ESA we have different programs. So the scientific program, which uh, uh, deals with the exploration of the solar system, has a process, of what we would say a bottom-up process, where scientists uh, propose missions and uh, there are all kinds of bodies selecting this mission and eventually being decided and eventually fly. Uh, we're doing amazing missions in, in, in ESA, in the solar system, too. we're launching very soon to, Jup to Mercury and, and soon to Jupiter. But it's true that the small body community and the small bodies, uh, there's no resin in the next, I would say, even 20 years. And uh, I, I share somehow the frustration of all, all we have learned also in terms of technologies to fly around these small gravity bodies like in Rosetta, that is somewhat lost. Uh, planetary defense is a bit different because planetary defense is, a, is, a, is, not, a, is not within the science uh, mainstream, but it uh, has a dedicated board. So in this sense, uh, we're looking into ways where we can uh, push for and propose to our member states a mission to test uh, a planetary defense uh, mission uh, concept. And uh, that's what we did uh, last, last year in December. Uh, it was the AIM mission, which is part of uh, an AIDA cooper a cooperation with NASA called AIDA. And uh, we got quite some funding, I must say. We got up to 76 million euros, which showed that uh, for the first time in Europe, there's, uh, there's a big interest uh, in to do something concretely. Uh, we needed 100 million, um, so we couldn't start the project. So what we're doing now is to scale down this mission to something that is more affordable and in in particular, we're considering uh, launching with other satellites, typically uh, commercial satellites, telecom or tele television satellites, into a, into a commercial orbit. And from there, use the electric propulsion and go to an asteroid. Mm -hmm. And this would save us uh, quite some cost. So we're starting to work on this, and we're engaged in discussions with the, our European governments uh, to see if we can uh, get this uh, supported. You see the, the we talk about money here, 76 million. The mission costed originally 200 million. It seems big for the people. It's just a tunnel. Just a tunnel costs 200 million. A soccer stadium like one in my town costs 600 million. So 200 is really affordable, especially when it will allow us to test a deflection technology, which will allow us to say, you know, now we have something verified. We decreased much the risk of an impact. So for me, it's still something I cannot understand how this could not happen. Noting also, because I also sometimes hear these critics, oh, but why do you send uh, 200 million in space? No, we don't send the money in space. It goes into jobs, industries, research, uh, students, postdocs, etc. We train people. So there's something I, I don't understand. And you know, next year, there will be an enthusiasm when we will see these first images of the asteroids. Believe me, the NASA and JAXA are preparing a communication. And 
Europe will be left like, uh, and what are we doing? Yeah. As, as you were saying that, it's probably the transfer fee for Cristiano Ronaldo as well, isn't it? Which is a small <laughs> price to pay. But you know, uh, Marino, uh, you're from Luxspace. Right. We're in Luxembourg. Could you describe what Luxspace is and what the link is to asteroids? Yeah, sure. So uh, Luxspace is building satellites, actually. They are small, small satellites. And how are they relevant to this discussion? Yes, I think so, because um, even in your mission, uh, where there were prospecting satellites foreseen, which are small satellites, microsatellites, so to speak. And I think it's all about gathering knowledge. We heard about deflection techniques, which are based on good models, and so that the prediction is high, or the reliability that the predicted behavior will be, will be like that. And for that, uh, knowledge gathering is the key, and this can be done by uh, small satellites. So our approach would be, to build affordable uh, platforms, uh, satellite platforms, first for low Earth, um, low Earth constellations, and building on that knowledge, then uh, to follow the roadmap by building derivatives which are capable of doing deep space exploration. Mm. So this is the relevance of what my company is doing uh, to that topic of this forum here. This is key, isn't it, when we talk about money? That the fact that yeah, yeah, affordability was the key word here. Well, yeah. I must say what we're looking at today is also a new, I would say, a new phenomenon is happening is that industries are taking the initiative to go into space uh, for commercial purpose, be it now yeah, with uh, resources or many other things. So even us as space agencies, we're looking at the, the way we interact with industries in a different way. And I must say in this reform mission, uh, there is room for industries to actually take the lead uh, into some of uh, these elements. We're looking at new types of uh, uh, what we call public-private partnerships that we're going to explore in the coming months. I, I say we've got um, a question, I think, on the Twitter wall from Sabinia. We do. First of all, we got some acknowledgement that they we're being thanked for watching out for Earth, which is also a nice thing to hear. But the question is, what would be worse, a comet or asteroid strike? Or are they the same, having the same impact? Uh, you want to well, Sure. I mean, um, what's really important is the size of the object and the speed of the object, the speed at which it hits the Earth. So um, for the same size, it doesn't matter, and the same speed, it doesn't really matter whether you call it a comet or an asteroid. But comets tend to be larger than most of the asteroids, and they're uh, quite a bit larger, and they tend to come in at much higher speeds. So in that sense, a uh, typical comet is uh, far more dangerous should it hit the Earth than a typical asteroid just because of the size and speed difference. Mm -hmm. However, there are many, many more asteroids that cross Earth's orbit than there are comets. So if you actually look at the risk between the two, it's actually dominated by asteroids because there are so many more of them. Well, I, yeah, I do have one thing to add. The problem, one of the problems with comets um, that asteroids don't necessarily have is it's very difficult to find comets early because they're yeah. on such highly eccentric orbits. They're coming from deep space. So if you find a comet that's on an Earth impacting yeah. trajectory, it's hard probably to do it's going it. to be very hard to deflect it's much that. Harder to do something However, about the probability is extremely low the that, probability that this is, happens, yeah. which is good for us. Although, although <laughs> we saw with Schumacher Levy 9 that when they but do exactly hit a planet, the they make a mess. Is, Jupiter is really massive, and they have to first pass Jupiter before coming to Earth, because comets come from much further away than asteroids. Asteroids come from region between Mars and Jupiter. The comet comes from much further away, so they have to cross first the giant planets. And the likelihood that they cross and the impact the giant planet first is much larger than the likelihood. So, of course, some of them pass because we see them. But the probability, because they are highly inclined compared to the orbit of the Earth, so that's why they have a high speed. But there is just one point where they can cross the Earth. And if you make the math, the probability is extremely low. So we're lucky. I really look at them as two different questions. I mean, it's not like I'm saying, will I solve for asteroids yeah. or will yeah. I solve yeah. for comets? Well, let's start with the easier case, which is, and the more common case, asteroids. Yes. Mm -hmm. I would like to eventually solve the comet case, but we probably have more time. Well, thank you all again, and over to Sabinia. <laughs> it's my fault. I should have had the haircut before I came out. That's what's confusing the issue. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Um, well, now it gives me great pleasure to um, welcome via Skype um, Lord Martin Rees. Um, Lord Rees was one of the early uh, 
supporters of Asteroid Day. He's the Astronomer Royal uh, in Britain. And he's also the co-founder for the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk. And Martin, thank you so much for joining us. The question that I have for you is, what level of resource should we devote to studying asteroids um, with a view to planetary defence? Hi, Sir George. Now, first, let me say how great it is to be linked to you. I'm sorry I'm not with you in person, um, but I think it is interesting to try and put these asteroid risks in the context of the other risks that we worry about. Now, there are two kinds of risks that we worry about. Uh, one is the natural risks, which include asteroids, of course, but also earthquakes and storms, etc. The second kind are those that are caused by us nuclear, cyber, bio, and all that. The latter ones are actually the ones that in the long run I worry most about because they're getting larger. The good thing about the asteroid risk is first that it's no larger now than it was uh, for the Neanderthals or even the dinosaurs, and also it's predictable. And the advantage is that we can predict the risk and also that we can, uh, as we've heard, uh, do something to uh, uh, protect against it. Um, to put it in numbers, I think uh, the numbers suggest that we have a few chances in a million of being killed by an asteroid. Now, at first sight, that may seem much too high an estimate because hardly anyone's been killed by an asteroid in recorded history. But the reason that's the right number is that the risk is dominated by the big ones. And the biggest risk to us is that a huge asteroid killing asteroid comes in the next 50 years, when most people now are living are still alive. And that's why it's true to say that the mean death rate per year from asteroids is about 100. And if you then take that figure into account and ask what is the amount of money one should spend if you do an insurance premium calculation, multiplying probability against the downside, it becomes appropriate for the world to spend a few hundred million dollars a year to reduce the asteroid risk. And of course, uh, we might want to spend a bit more because there is scientific interest anyway. So it's not just planetary defense, it's just astronomy as well. So it is reasonable that we should be spending substantially more than we actually are worldwide on the asteroid risk and ways to reduce it and the ways to have the maximum forewarning if there is going to be a asteroid heading our way and of course optimizing the techniques for deflecting it. And where do you think that we should start um, spending that money for the best return? Well I defer to the experts who we've just been hearing and I think it's important that we should develop techniques for uh, nudging the orbit so we can deflect a large asteroid uh, if we identify its potentially Earth crossing, but also we want to understand what they're made of because that affects the way in which it's safe to disrupt them without making things worse. And of course, we want to know more about them. And the reason why we need these uh, further asteroid focused missions is that most of the asteroids down to 50 meters across are still not identified. So the first thing to do is to identify all the ones that could be a serious threat and then, of course, track them so that we can uh, uh, have advanced warning many decades ahead if they're likely to impact. So I think the uh, surveys and the searches are important, plus the techniques to deflect them, plus also, obviously, uh, landing on one to see what they're made of and how fragile they are. And once we have detected these asteroids, um, is it important then that we find out what they're made from and develop our strategies for how to move them if we need to from that point of view? Oh, absolutely, because if they're very fragile, then of course uh, you don't want to explode them because then you get a shower that could be more dangerous. So it's very important to know what they're uh, made of and uh, how much of a stress they can bear without being torn apart. And that affects the balance between the uh, various types of uh, uh, ways in which you can nudge the orbit, whether it's got to be the gravity tractor or whether it can be uh, some slightly more violent way of impacting them. So you want to know what they're made of. And of course, as a bonus, we scientists want to know that anyway, quite apart from the risks they present to the Earth. 
Okay. So, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Martin. Um, I've just had a message that uh, Greg says hi. So hi. We, we wish you a good afternoon and thank you for joining us. We're going over now to Asteroid Day in Germany. Hello, how are you and how are things going there? Hey. Hi. Nice to see you. Yeah. As you said, or not yet said, we are from the Neo 2 project and uh, we are located directly at the Lake of Konstanz in the south of Germany. And to be honest, we were very, very proud to take over the responsibility to become the regional coordinators for Astro Day Germany. So this year we promoted Astro Day quite a lot and uh, supported many, many events. Several observatories, uh, planetariums, uh, other organizations from all over Germany joined us to give uh, special lectures. Uh, workshops uh, and even uh, asteroid life observations. Yeah. And we have had, um, something like 20 observatories and planetaria join in this year? Yes, something like that. So, when I will give you some more information, there are more than 25 uh, events we are supporting this year. And we have also organized a local event right here at the lake uh, where we will talk about Asteroid Day and give a special lecture on Neo Shield 2. And finally, we will conclude with streaming Rick's movie 51 Degrees North. Yes, only, uh, today only we have uh, more than 15 events taking place, but in total there are more than 25 uh, events fully dedicated to Asteroid Day, uh, taking place in different days because every day is Asteroid Day, mm -hmm. and people can check the full list and more details about the German events on the neoshield2.eu and of course on asteroidday.org as well. And how are you being supported there? Is there a, a, a large interest in the public there for this kind of thing? Well, we have some, let's say, material which we provided uh, for the presentations. Uh, we sent out flyers, Astro Day stickers, uh, Neo Shield stickers. Uh, we provided uh, presentations material, uh, which they are going to be used, and of course, uh, large posters. Uh, so join us for Astro Day, which was one of the key messages uh, which we uh, provided all the parties uh, to organize their local events. Yep, thank you very much for joining and uh, letting us know how it's going. I wish you well with the rest of the day. Um, but for now, um, we're going over to um, Gianluca and finding out what's happening over there. Thank you, Stuart. We are leaving again to reach Japan and meet again Dr. Seitaro Urakawa, uh, waiting for us at Bisei Observatory, and he is a member of Japan Space Guard Association. So welcome back, Seitaro. How are you? Uh. Uh, I'm fine, but the weather is not fine. <laughs> I understand. So uh, our hopes to have a little, a little mean, a little hole in the clouds is not. It was yeah. not a good dream, I see. <laughs> but I would like to ask you if you have some images you did from there or you find of interest just to share with our audience because they are really curious about asteroids and how they look like through a real telescope. You know. Yeah. Okay. So I prepared two images. Thank you. We so are just, the, to see. Uh, just a moment, please. So we are just trying yeah. to, to see some images. This is good. Can I see this image? No? Unfortunately, no. I see that. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of object oh. you were going to show? Which, uh, which the, one? The, I prepared the, the asteroid Apophis. Oh, uh, famous it takes Apophis, uh, 2012. But the other is uh, 1.2 meter telescopes, uh, super telescope. As for Apophis asteroid, did you observe it? it they, I, I think it was uh, one image of yours. I mean, Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, the image of Apophis was captured from your observatory, right? Yes. Yes, so you were one of those following Apophis while he, he was coming back on 2012. So no. I. I remember you, I saw your observation on the minor planet circular. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so I um, I think that for the observing live observing it is not possible to do this because of the clouds. So, I still want to thank you for joining us, no matter the clouds. And I hope that there you will have good weather in the uh, next nights. I don't know if you have checked the weather, by the way. How do the nights look like? For the next. Ah, thank you very much. So I'm sorry to the not show the image. Oh, thank you. Sorry. 
Okay, so thank, thank you very much. And I still want to ask uh, you to join Future Edition. And now it, I want to go back to Sabine. Thank you, Gianluca, and I'm now in company with George Schmidt, who is member of the Advisory Board of Space Resources, and you were also, also recently appointed chair of the Asteroid Foundation. Welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, as a member of the Advisory Board of Space Resources, you're also keenly um, engaged in the efforts to position Luxembourg um, as an ideal location for innovation projects and, of course, um, projects in advanced space technologies. But why do you also find it important to support an initiative like Asteroid Day? Well, we've learned uh, all day today that uh, Asteroid Day is about uh, raising awareness and uh, distributing information, promoting knowledge uh, among the general public. It's mm. important that the general public uh, knows about the threats uh, and about the way to mitigate them, but also about the opportunities uh, that um, uh, asteroids uh, provide, and we will speak uh, more of that um, uh, later on. And it is about the opportunities that the Space Resources .lu, uh, mm. initiative is all about, about the opportunity to uh, use the resources uh, uh, from uh, uh, asteroids, uh, for example, for the benefit of all of us. Mm. Mm. This is precisely uh, the vision of the Luxembourg uh, Space Resources .lu uh, 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 initiative. Uh, asteroids, as we know, contain large amounts of, uh, of resources, uh, water and materials and minerals, and uh, they can be put to use um, for space exploration and perhaps, is, if necessary, even to bring them back to Earth uh, if, if, if needed. Mm. Now, to reach the goals of, of Space Resources .lu, we need to communicate with the public at large. We need to get their support. And, uh, uh, and, and so uh, the action plan of the Space Resources Initiative has a big part uh, 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 given to this communication with, um, uh, mm -hmm. with the public at uh, large. We need to excite the public about these opportunities. We, ex we need to excite mm -hmm. and inspire That's our true. younger generation mm -hmm. perhaps to choose a career path or their studies uh, in this area. So I think it's quite natural that Space Resources and uh, Asteroid Day have lots in common. Well, I'm, on behalf of Astro Day, I'm very happy for our collaboration and synergies. And I agree with you that we need to also influence and inspire the younger generation, which they might be inspired. So stay tuned, because now it's time for Brian Cox and his new panel.